Today we got another natural born leader who is uh, printing a little bit more. And all they care about is how can I acquire, how, how can I get paid, how yeah. can I get that Stripe notification every day. Yeah. And when it comes to fulfillment, do you think everyone has to have a phase in their life when they're selling? With 30k a month, there's not a lot of room to build the business. You charge anywhere from all the way up to 50 we cannot grow from new clients, new clients, new clients, new clients a month. That That's like a crazy business. Like it's actually crazy. There's no way I'm gonna make 300 grand a month with this business. Mm -hmm. it's, it's solving a good problem, but I'm not winning. You have to give up something you really like to grow. Was closing for you? No. For some people it's appointment setting, for others it's onboarding clients. And it's like, I haven't onboarded a client in the last, I don't know how long. Yeah, so while I was at school, mm -hmm. um, I had like a year left to my degree before I graduated. Um, had very good grades. However, that summer, I had to take an internship to get my degree. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't too fond of it. I just wanted to use the summer to work on myself, work on a business idea or whatever. Um, and then this one day I went to class. There was this piece of paper that was stuck to my back after I sat on the chair. So I, I took the piece of paper and it was a door-to-door -door knocking job. So I no, looked at I it and it said like, Oh, students can make 40, 50K a summer working for us selling pest control. I was like, yeah. you know, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> uh, so I basically went on that, um, went on the website. I applied, ended up doing that instead. So I worked a full summer doing door-to-door -door knocking. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really found sort of my, my skill set. I had mentors and everything, and they taught me everything that I know today about sales. Mm. Finished the summer. Uh, I did pretty good numbers. And that's when I realized, I was like, okay, I have a pretty good talent when it comes to selling. So and then I said to myself, how can I utilize those skills and sell something, sell a product or a service? Uh, so that's when I started doing more research. I fell into SMMA, selling marketing services. I started my own agency, was cold calling 100, 200 businesses every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, scaled that to about 10K a month. Um, and yeah, from there, I just started documenting everything on YouTube. People Sick. were reaching out to me, asking me for help, for advice. And that's when I slowly transitioned towards coaching. Uh, and now today, that's my main focus. I just help people replicate those types of results, okay. uh, give them all the sales skills. That's mostly what I focus on is sales, how to become a good salesperson. And, okay. Yeah, all nice. The processes. Nice. So you did most of your, you, you acquired most of your client from doing cold calls? Yes. At the very first, at the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so. uh, and then did you venture into other channels? No. no. All I did was cold calling. Because of my door knocking skills. I was mm -hmm. very good at just interacting with people in person. Mm -hmm. That was sales for me. I didn't re I didn't even know like cold DMs, cold email, yeah. and things like that existed back then. Um, so I figured I'd use my skill set, which was just having conversations with people. Um, transition. So that's when I focused on cold calling, mm -hmm. scaled it. And then afterwards, I got introduced to uh, my, he's today, he's my head, um, head appointment center. Mm -hmm. He's the one that introduced me to cold DMs and all of these things. Okay. So, uh, at first, it was just cold calling. That was the only thing I was doing. Sick. And um, so, oh, fuck, I forgot what I was about to say, but keep this in. <laughs> can we swear? Um, uh, yeah, we can, yeah. Was, you can swear. Sweet. You can swear whatever you want to say. You can say whatever you want to say. Um, okay, cool. So, oh, yeah, I remember what I just wasn't wanted to ask you. You were cold calling. So that means that most of your clients were local. Yes. So when I had my agency, yeah, I was selling like marketing services. So Google ads, Facebook ads, the traditional sort okay. of business model. I was cold calling mostly plumbers mm. with anything in the home improvement niche. Okay. All right. So I cold called those people and that's when I sort of. How did that work out? What were you? So walk me through what was your pricing and what was the experience helping them? Yeah. So I was more focused on the higher ticket. So I would. I basically realized there's two paths I could take. Mm -hmm. Either I only work with like smaller plumbers, people who are maybe solo, they have one or two guys working under them. Mm -hmm. Those people max 501k a month retainers. Um, or I could go after the bigger businesses, the ones that had a huge team, really had the need to just increase sort of uh, lead flow, getting more clients in the door. Yeah. So because I was decent at cold calling, and I even cold called here in French in, in Quebec. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was less competition than like uh, in the English yeah, market. Yeah. Um, I went after the bigger businesses. So my retainers were anywhere from two to, let's say, 4,000. I think that was the highest per month that I was charging. Okay. Um, and luckily, I had a very good uh, media buyer on, on my team, and he would basically take care of the entire fulfillment on my behalf. Nice. Okay, so as soon as I close the deal, send him over. He takes care of everything for me. We have a good uh, profit, sort of, like, basically, he would get 25% of the revenue. 
I did 75 mm -hmm. and we basically okay. just operate the business that way. Interesting. Okay. Love it. Love it. Now, um, let's fast forward. So now you get into coaching, um, you know, before you joined, you want to kind of like explain what was your offer, kind of like how you were serving. Yep. So after that agency sort of venture of mine, um, mm -hmm. I was still working on it. I just wanted to build a personal brand. It was yeah. sort of a trend that I was noticing. I was seeing that every, you know, big entrepreneur, they always had some sort of personal brand behind them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to do as well. So I started documenting everything on YouTube. And as I was documenting my journey, how I scaled my agency, slowly people were coming to me and asking me for help, for advice. So I wasn't really planning on becoming a coach. It just kind of <laughs> fell that way, you know? Yeah. So people were coming to me. They were asking me for help, for advice. Uh, so I... After taking, at first, I would just charge a hundred bucks for an hour long call, and it was just like a consulting call. So they would tell me their problems, and I would help them, give them resources, and everything. Yeah. And then this one day, um, this guy came to me and he's like, Oliver, can I pay you, let's say, 500 bucks and you coach me for a month or two months? And I was like, okay, we can do that. <laughs> so that was like the first time I got like a pretty decent sized package, at least yeah. back then. And I kind of stuck with that number. So I was charging people 500 bucks. And I would give them multiple one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. And I paired it up with uh, sort of all of the scripts, the resources that I used to help scale my agency. Yeah. Focused on that, uh, we did scale it to about um, like 100 clients, uh, more or less. Yeah. And that was my main offer for okay. uh, like right before I joined GCP. Yeah. I was focusing on that. So helping people with their agencies at 500 So what was, what was your monthly revenue from that? I was capping at like 30K per month. Okay. And you had how many people paying you 500 bucks to make 30K? Um, it was a one-time payment of 500 bucks. Interesting. So about 60 people, yeah. So would you, so would you close 60 new people every month? Yep. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. I thought it was 500 bucks a monthly no. recurring revenue, meaning it's maybe a six-month thing, and then they pay 500, 500. No, it was... Hey, One I'll, I'll help you, 500 bucks. And then next month you had to go find, mm -hmm. you are able to replace 60, uh, a good chunk of that 60 every yep. month? Yes. Oh, <laughs> that shit. is sort of one of the reasons why I decided to join GCP. Damn. I, I realized I that <laughs> that wasn't like a sustainable way to scale a business. It worked though. Like, I mean, it, like, yeah. Like people, this is funny, people will laugh when I tell them that. Yeah. But we're still to this day, we're using that business model as like a low ticket way to get people to buy our high ticket offer yeah. and it's working yeah we are onboarding anywhere from 40 to 60 people and it's mostly like through organic through youtube and it's very passive it's easy to do mm -hmm. uh, i have multiple coaches they do weekly group calls with my students they help them with everything we give them the resources yeah and if the person is not at the stage to work with our different offer then that is like a good sort of way for us to build them the foundations. Mm -hmm. We get them to where they're supposed to be to help to work with our second offer. Mm -hmm. And that's when we sort of mm. upsell them. Makes sense. Makes sense. I thought I thought when you joined it was you had 60 people paying you 500 bucks every single month. I didn't know it was more of like a, it was a one off thing. Whoa, that that makes it even more scary. Yeah. Um and then, uh, yeah, for those who, you know, maybe I can kind of like try to explain why to, why it's so much of a of a complex move to do. It's because, one, you're selling people at a low ticket, 500 bucks, but you're also not locking them into something bigger. So that means mm -hmm. that potentially the LTV, because you didn't have any other thing to sell them. Exactly. Right now, it, it makes sense because you might have this and that. Mm -hmm. But before, it was your main thing. So you were yep. only sell one person once. Mm -hmm. But like within 500 bucks, the unit economics don't make sense because it's like, okay, do you have to realize that eventually you're going to need to pay for attention. Yep. Then you're going to need someone to convert that attention into money, which could be a setter, then a closer. Mm -hmm. Then you need to pay a fulfillment, yep. right? Then you might need to pay for Zoom. Then you might need to pay rent. Then you might need to pay mm -hmm. your car, yep. right? With 30K a month, there's not a lot of room yep. to build the business. For you, one man team, it probably makes sense. If you have mm -hmm. a setter, we just cl call closing or closing it through DMs. That could be a good model. Yeah. But if you're wanting to build freedom, that that LTV is too small to actually make anything happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then you joined GCP. Uh, kind of like describe why you joined, and then kind of like what we went through 
with um, mm -hmm. kind of like how you applied the different protocol. Yeah, so essentially exactly what you just explained was yeah. my thought process as I was scaling the business. So I was like, look, this is not sustainable. Even if I do hire more setters and I just increase volume at scale, it's more likely going to break, especially at a $500 price point. Mm -hmm. And because we were working with beginners, it was harder to justify a higher ticket retainer. So that was kind of like the sweet spot for us. Mm -hmm. um, I learned this concept uh, from a book or an article, like I read it somewhere. Basically explain the way you operate a business. You can either, or you can do both. There's like the front end and the back end of scaling a business. Mm -hmm. So most people, which is what I was doing, is just focusing on the front end, which is just acquiring as many clients as you can and not really caring what happens after you get the clients. So the churn rate or whatever, completely ignore, just we'll get more clients on the door. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to transition into a model where we would acquire clients in the front end, but also keep them in the back end by providing like a good service or some sort of monthly recurring revenue or upsell and you know provide them with uh, more additional support or more advanced training. Yeah, And that is why I joined GCP because I said to myself, I'm like, what? That's what I was kind of trying to bridge like the gap that I was facing was what should I sell to these people? Yeah. What should be the second offer? What is the next natural thing that these people are going to need yeah. once they see the results from my initial product? So I joined you guys. Um, and that's when I sort of introduced my second offer where now we take more of like, a, as you say, like the build and release approach. So we basically will build them the entire acquisition system on their behalf. So nice. beforehand, we would teach them basic tools like cold calling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But obviously, that's not scalable to 100K per month. Yeah. So now we build them either a paid ads infrastructure or appointment sending team, you know, whatever is most appropriate. Mm -hmm. We build it, we make sure it works well, and then they have the tools, the infrastructure to scale as high as they want with yeah. the business. Yeah. And uh, you, <laughs> this is something that um, kind of like demonstrates the in the the power of positioning something like, hey, you're selling them an infrastructure, something mm -hmm. that inevitably solves the gap, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because that it's not that build and release will necessarily solve and guarantee success, but it's as good as it gets, mm -hmm. right? Meaning you pay me a lot of money, yeah. but I'll take care of every single step, not just the protocol, mm -hmm. but also the, infra the, the actual systems, insight, and if you need talent, maybe that yep. could also be one thing. But it's like, I give you the protocol, but I also make sure that the protocol is implemented in your business, right? Mm -hmm. And it's as good as it gets. Yep. And without having to stick you into a retainer monthly, and then you have to pay me every month for me to make anything work. Exactly. Um, and one of, you know, Oliver's transformation is one of the best because he went from such a business, business kind of like monetization model where he was having a lot of clients to one-tenth mm -hmm. and doubling the business revenue. You want to kind of like share the numbers you did after your launch your kind of like infrastructure offer? Yep. So um, obviously we increase the price of our building release. Yeah. Uh, depending on the type of client that we work with, we charge anywhere from 7.5 all the way up to 15,000. Um, and yeah, as you said, uh, the amount of volume that's required to make, let's say 100K per month, which is more or less where we're at right now with the business. I only need, let's say, a 10K price point. I only need 10 clients per month. Yeah. You know, and when you compare that to 60 clients a month, <laughs> my team, it, it's it's a, it's a lot easier to do. Yeah. You know, and many people will believe that um, that is one thing that you help me a lot with is I, for the longest time, would, would believe that if I charge 10 times more, it would be 10 times harder to close these people. Yeah. So I'm like, there's no way I can sell at that Maybe, price point. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, is it harder? Slightly, but it's not 10 times harder. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe 1.5 times harder, yeah. maybe two times at most if you're you know, just beginning at sales. But if you have a good product, it's just about going after the right market. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the same mm -hmm. market that would buy the build and release is not the same type of people that would buy my $500 product. No. So just switching that approach, going after a different market and using the exact same strategies we've been using before, mm -hmm. boom. Yeah, uh, about 3x our revenue. So when we joined GCP, we were at about 30K per month with mm -hmm. um, the $500 offer. And now today we're about 100K per month. Uh, and crazy. It's mostly focusing on the back end now, just trying to build something that can scale yeah. up to 300, 500K per month. And yeah, it's crazy. Because, you know, because for me, I saw the the, the transformation, right? Because um, cause I remember asking you, I think it was maybe like 60 days into the program when you launched it. Uh, and you send a message like, hey, um, 
I just onboarded a six clients this past month and I mm-hmm. made like 77K. Yeah. That was our first month. I think uh, joining our second month of crazy. launching the offer. Yeah. Crazy. And for me, that's where I'm like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. Like there's something here because, and, and you know, it, it makes sense. You know, it's like, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Like for me, if I also got into the game, because for me it was different, right? If for me, it's like, my agency was the appointment setting. It's mm-hmm. not like I scaled. I mean, I did scale the agency, but then I was like, there's way more product market fit mm-hmm. in starting an appointment setting agency because all these people were being flooded into the marketplace yep. into starting businesses. But they they had this one thing that they didn't master, which is how do I get a stranger to want to speak on me with me on a call to mm-hmm. buy my services? Yep. So for me, I saw this this demand with zero almost zero supply Mm -hmm. right and i mastered the solution and i went and done did it right but it's me through doing it that i was like oh it's i was charging like a thousand maybe 1500 maybe 2k a month at most Mm -hmm. and i had like 10 vas working for me 14 vas at some point uh and i had like 25 clients doing done free appointment setting i mean that was great i was making 30k a month but then at some point i was like i'm way too smart to be hustling like this. Yeah. I was like, there's no way I'm going to make 300 grand a month with this business. Mm-hmm. It's, it's solving a good problem, but I'm not winning. Yeah. I'm going to get old. That's the only thing I'm going to get old. I'm not going to get rich. I'm going to get old. So for me, I was forced to do it. But if you told me that, hey, I'll pay you 500 bucks to coach me on how to set it up myself, mm-hmm. I probably would have fell through the same trap as you yeah. and gotten, you know, 500 bucks for what four calls a month that's 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 bro that's amazing exactly give me to them give me 100 people please 50 <laughs> g's a month i'll sell 100 hours times four 400 hours a month so i think for you is that you did this but since you you were kind of like pivoting mm-hmm. you didn't have the infrastructure to be able to build and release does that make sense? Exactly. So if yeah. but if you probably went to Homer modeling, mm-hmm. you probably could have turned it into a BNR and then sold it for 10K because you had the media buyer that had probably mm-hmm. the best, the right creatives that work, the right copy. Yep. You could have probably sourced them a media buyer, right? Mm-hmm. And you could have built and released, but because yep. you switched to a to a, to a segment of a niche, a vertical yep. that you didn't have an infrastructure for. So the easiest path was consulting or coaching. I have a question for you. Please. Do you believe that I could have jumped straight to build and release without going through that phase of selling a $500 product? Do you think everyone has to have a phase in their life when they're selling? Yeah. Uh, no. So I don't think, so you can't, so this is the thing. And I think a lot of people, because I, I, since I've pushed out build and release, I could tell you every day mm-hmm. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. I see people selling build and release who've like, they're selling the model to other agencies. I'm like, okay, so you're telling me you failed at running a business at mm-hmm. even making $10,000 a month? You've watched my 10 hour, five day fucking content. Mm-hmm. And now you're taking 10 hours of learning mm-hmm. and you th- and some Lucy chart that I gave away for free. Yeah. And you think that you're qualified to go build and release a model? That, like they're not even building anything. They're literally yeah. building and releasing information. Selling the idea. Yeah. I'm like, so here's the thing. My advice to these people. Here is what will happen to you guys. You guys will be able to sell. Because I've put out enough thesis and enough breakdown for you to be able to sell it to someone else and it will make complete sense because mm-hmm. it's logic. Yeah. But what happens with a business where you're actually selling and, and cheating the universe mm-hmm. is that you will get rich it's really fast. But then people won't make any results, won't get any results, yeah. right? Because the thing people don't see is that for me to even be able to help our partners and maybe people in GS.io to implement or even learn, Mm -hmm. I'm having to spend like 150, 200 grand a month on payroll. Is it because I'm, is it because I can't sit down and fucking make a Loom video? No. It's because it takes 100, 200 grand to make someone successful. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you go and cheat the game, but in the back end, your back end is not dialed in. Mm-hmm. Like people come in and it's like the next day onboarding. And then, hey, we know that people fail into filling out their form. Okay, hey, let's fill out the form on a call. And then, hey, we need to your ads launched. Okay, cool. Oh, you're going to be like, oh, s- set up your ads. 
set up your ads manager. Oh, oh, I have a, my ads manager just got banned. Uh, this and that. It's like there's a lot of little in, from the outlook. It might, oh, I launched that. Yeah, right. Or hey, I placed a dialing team or built a dialing system. It might seem simple, but it's the it's the tedious little obstacles that happen when someone is trying to get started on a path that we solved a million times over that make it so that if you don't have those things, you can sell, but you will not build a business. I can promise you. It's very true. It doesn't work. It's I was saying, I was actually on a call today with um, a guy who we've just recently onboarded, a guy who worked with some of the big names, um, kind of like just onboarding him for the media buying side of things, work with a um, company that was doing 90 million a year uh, with three brands and, you know, it's like consulting brands. Uh, and then he's also worked in uh, solar with a um, company that's doing like 5 million a month, mm-hmm. an agency actually doing 5 million a month. So I was like, holy shit, that's crazy. But what I told him was, because he was working with that other company that ended up shutting down. And I was like, well, the reason why th- this online space is a little weird is because Um, especially in the coaching space, people are promised these outcomes. But the thing is that if I go to a restaurant, like if after this we go to a restaurant, right? And then we are like, hey, it's a pasta restaurant. We order pasta, but then they bring a burger with no fries, okay? That restaurant is not going to be existent. It's not good. Like, why would we go back again? We won't go back again. But then if they only rely on just getting people in the front door for for the perception that they're going to get pasta. Well, if enough people get a burger without fries, they're going to start talking about it. Mm-hmm. And when you start talking about it, no matter how good you're good at acquisition, the the marketing here going against you is going to drive up the cost on your acquisition, right? And then it will become way more expensive mm-hmm. to sell someone on the pizza and on, on the pasta than it is on the fulfillment of the burger. So it's like now the cost of acquisition goes way up, so high up that you don't even have enough margins to pay for fulfillment. And then that's when the business crumbles. So we started at GS.io because I was like, hey, guys, like, don't try to build and release. You have no, you haven't done shit. Well, you're building and releasing on what? Just because you know that ads could be or a VSL funnel could be good and that you can run a meta ads to it doesn't mean you can actually help someone execute, right? So we started just that more of like an incubator because no, I'm like, hey, you haven't done, you don't have experience, you don't have capital, just get it. Get, get let's scale you, let's give you the protocol. You make money, and then you know, find something interesting, right? It's a very good idea. Yeah, it's. I think most people when they start businesses, they're so fixated on the idea of making a bunch of money, buying the Lambos and everything. Yeah, and all they care about is how can I acquire, how can I get paid, how yeah. can I get that Stripe notification every day. Yeah. But when it comes to fulfillment, there's Nobody. zero effort compared Nobody to acquisition. Cares. Yeah. So they'll onboard clients. Nothing's going to happen. They'll be pissed. Then it's going to be disputes, yeah. refunds, a bunch of bad news. So yeah, um, I, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see. People, want, they get in the space. They don't really care about the outcome of the client. Yeah. And uh, that's one thing. And it's easy trouble. too. But, but it's because there are a lot of people who, who get by doing it, right? Like I see a lot of people who push crazy lifestyle. I mean, I guess I also somewhat do push some lifestyle to it. You have a nice penthouse, huh? <laughs> like I have a nice penthouse, but it's because I'm getting white hair uh, in my beard. So I needed to, to at least get in a nice penthouse before I die. Um, it's from all the stress. If you're going to be stressed, be stressed in a penthouse at least. Um, but I've but I see so many people, and it's actually the easiest way to sell people. Just show them nice things. It's the best sales letter. You don't. You could literally. If I had like a Patek and I had on a, um, you know, crazy expensive shoes, $10,000 shirt, $10,000 pants, and I pulled up in a Wraith, um, I don't actually have to say much. People are going to click that link. Mm. People are going to buy the thing, right? So it's almost like seeing it is the... It's it's instant social proof. It's I mean, a crazy just, proof. It's one of the main reasons. It sounds a bit shallow. Yeah. Okay. Like I'm not someone who's very... Like I don't have a Rolex. I wear yeah. regular clothes. Like I'm not a fancy person. I, I'm a humble person. Yeah. Um, I funny enough, it happened when I um, you hosted like a, um, this event wine like night? around my yeah wine night exactly in November around my birthday. Yeah. And we were having a conversation, and I remember we were having a conversation about my car. 
Mm-hmm. At the time, I was making, I think, 50, 60 K per month, more or less. Yeah. And I was driving my Honda Civic, which <laughs> had the cracked windshield, the squeaky <laughs> brakes, no AC. And I asked you, I'm like, bro, should I upgrade my car? Like, should I do it? And you yeah. gave me basically the biggest slap in my face. And you're like, bro, what's the point of making all this money if you don't even enjoy it? Yeah. And you asked me a question. What is it? How does it feel to make 50 K a month? And at that time. Yeah. And I was like, well, it doesn't feel any different than 10K a month. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, are you living a 50K per month lifestyle? And I'm like, well, not really. And he's like, well, that's your mistake. So I got the car. Now I drive an AMG. Uh, So I'm very happy, very proud about that. And funny enough, that for a fact I know has helped me make more sales. Mm. By simply having it on my Instagram, it's social proof that, okay, he did something. Yeah. Because you're not going to listen to... Uh, yeah, a guy who claims that can he can build you a business that makes 50k a month mm-hmm. if he's driving a Honda Civic. Yeah, and so I do think in certain spaces, not all of them, some level of social proof is required to really yeah. validate the fact that you are someone. You are someone that can help them. And for me, it's also another point. I don't. I think you can overdo it, right? Like I see a lot of people on Instagram who wear like Gucci clothes, LV clothes, um, buy like a bunch of cars. Like for me, I think there's overdoing it, right? And it can, you can tell, like you can tell that like this person has only figured out a way to sell people just from lifestyle stuff, right? So it's almost like it's the only way they know how to get attention. It's like they'll go buy new things every day and they'll maybe shoot content about it. And it's like, that's great. But it's like, that, that's also a rat race. You start it, you're, you're not, you better keep it up. And you, you're actually forced to keep it up because it's within you. You almost start giving yourself ideas. Oh, but it's like, oh, I need a new watch. Oh, I need a new car. Oh, I need to go to, on this trip. Oh, I need to do something to show people and then they can get me attention and validation. And then it's almost like the validation and the attention becomes the reason why you're buying things, mm-hmm. right? And, but for me, it's like, um, I also don't want the guy who has nothing. Right, like as an example, if you tell me, "Hey, uh, you should listen to Warren Buffett," yeah, I'll listen to his principles, but I probably don't want to live the same life as Warren Buffett. Mm-hmm. I don't care if he owns Berkshire Hathaway, which is like the sixth or seventh the most, the biggest market cap. I don't care because it's not just about who's who's the wealthiest; it's about who's lived the wealthiest life. And not wealthy in like money, but wealthy in memories, me- wealthy in, in experiences, wealthy in, you know, like for me, I want to, if I get a penthouse, I get a GT3 and I great, get a great family, I'm as happy as Elon Musk. I'm probably happier than him, actually. Right. So it's like, it's more, but, but it's, these are things that I like. It's almost like a, it's almost like a create my own mm-hmm. little uh, bucket of like, this is what perfection look like. Yeah. I'm trying to experience perfection. I'm not trying to get a GT3 so I can go flex on broke people mm-hmm. so they can buy my program, right? I'm buying it because I love cars and I would love to experience that type of product, mm-hmm. right? Or a penthouse. It's like, do you know what it feels like waking up on the 29th floor? I don't, I don't, I'm not doing it for someone else. I mean, hopefully it expires you to get here because, I mean, have you ever been on a date and then went to a 29th floor <laughs> penthouse? The girl will literally be like, holy shit. So it's like, it's almost like you you get to, it, you, it's almost, it's not really for me. It's almost like I get to, to bring people onto it like a different level. And then mm-hmm. it's that, it's that experience of showing someone else what's possible. And that man is, it's worth all the ex- monthly expenses. Mm-hmm. Like I wouldn't want to, I would never want to like go from paying o- over six figures a year in rent to paying 10K in rent in year because I want to save. No, it's like, it's worth that extra thing because the the value you get from experiencing great things, it can't be quantified mm-hmm. in like 90 grand. No, it's worth 9 million on how it makes you feel, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, for me, I like, I like, I like your car because when I was starting out, I wanted to, when I was... Because I did, I rented a C43 when I was um, starting to make a little bit of money. I drove it around. I was like, holy shit, this is a, I rented it to go to Ottawa uh, with my friends. And I was like, man, this is amazing, right? Uh, and I wanted the new one, but um, but I ended up going with the older C63. But um, 
you gotta love an AMG. It's a great experience. Yeah. yeah. It's it's I've always wanted to have a car, like a yeah. nice car. But I was like, okay, I think it's a bit too early. And then when you gave me the slap in the face, I was like, okay, let me give myself like one gift. Mm -hmm. And I remember I bought it on my birthday, which is exactly one year since I started the business, wow. like the coaching business. So I was uh, that was my thank you to myself. But yeah, I do think it's important to find a balance too, not to go too crazy, like you mentioned. I think that's one mistake most people do, at least from what the people I work with, I see. As yeah. soon as they start making some online they money, go, they go crazy. <laughs> they start buying everything left and right. Yeah. And uh, when you realize, let's say, let's say this this one friend, he he bought like a, like a duffel bag, like an LV bag. I think it was 4K or 5K or something like that. Yeah. I'm like, bro, that's ad spend, you know? It's, it's crazy. Like, uh, how much? Yeah. So I, I think there's like this balance. And I think most people, as soon as they start making money, they start going crazy. And yeah. that is also a factor that kind of leads to their downfall. Yeah. You know? Were you were you worried when you when you got um when you stacked on another bill per month with your car? Yes. Were you, yeah, extremely. Right? I was extremely yeah. I was at thirty K per month uh -huh. uh, living at my mom's uh in my mom's basement. Yeah. And I went to see my friend. I was looking at places and I found my place today, which is like 2K per month rent. Yeah. And I asked him, I'm like, bro, do you think I can afford this? Do you think this is like too much? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's definitely like at first I thought it was going to be like a big impact. But it's also because I came from like I was living by myself, didn't have any expenses. I was a student. So for me to make that transition to the big boy world, and also I dropped out from university, so I didn't mm -hmm. have any plan B. Like this was the plan. Like I had to make it work. Yeah. So there was lots on my shoulders, but at the end of the day, I don't regret anything. Uh, I think yeah. it was a good experience, but no, it's not that stressful, you know. Especially now, yeah. it's not too bad. You can buy a second. No, the reason why I ask it is because it's always it always seems new levels, because having a big expense is is is, mm -hmm. is a new level, right? Yeah. New levels from the outside seem way more dangerous and more worrisome than it actually is True. right which is why i think if we talk about okay should you upgrade your life i actually do think that it actually does help because it allows you to 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 increase your standards your standards of how much you can you can support losing right because for someone who's and this is why pe people with crazy profit margins um, never really get really courageous, right? Um, so as someone who's like making 85% margins in their business and their one-man team, mm -hmm. if you tell them like, hey, build a bigger business, they'll never because they'll mm -hmm. be like, so worried about losing 5K a month yeah. or 10K a month, right? But it's like, you're not going to make 100 million unless you give up on that fucking 10K a month. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're not going anywhere. Right. Yep. So for me, like upgrading the lifestyle, like even going into living in a penthouse, having two cars, um, you know, you I may think about it. I'm like, hey, I'll probably spend 15K a month just on my life, just on being able to sleep on a bed every fucking night. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but it's like, I don't I don't really notice it. I don't I don't wake up being like every month being like, oh, I'm going to pro probably spend 25K. Uh, this month or hey mm -hmm. we just went to cape town spent 30k on an airbnb for one week it's like okay well do i focus on how much i'm wasting or do i focus on making three million a month right mm -hmm. so it's like it because if i just spent 30k on an airbnb right here is the here is the, the 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 good the good analogy or this is a good example why it's actually good to spend sometimes if i just wasted thirty thousand dollars to go see a sunset for a few days and then I get a guy, a sales consultant, who helped Jim launch, and he quotes me a hundred grand. Most people would be like, "Holy shit!" Mm -hmm. But then in my mind, I'm like, "Well, I just wasted one third of what he's asking me, and mm -hmm. what he's asking me can five x our business, right?" Okay, hey, let's go. Fifty G's wired. Let's get to work. Yeah. But you don't get that courage mm -hmm. unless you're using to losing a bit, making it back. Losing it, making a shit ton more, you know? So it actually makes you, 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 you start, you start, you get some fucking balls when you've spent money. Mm -hmm. It's true. I, I faced that maybe like three months ago. Yeah. Um, as I was scaling the new offer, obviously, as you said, I cannot do this by myself. I probably could, but as I'd be stuck working yeah. in, on my business the, yeah. for the rest of my life or in my business. Um, so I started hiring people. My payroll now is about 20, 30K per month. Sick. Back then, I was stressing about a 2K per month rent wow. uh, bill. 
It's crazy. Now all my expenses combined, maybe 30K, including lifestyle and business and everything. Yeah. Um, so you get used to it. And I think a common misconception is that at our like income level or higher income level, we don't stress about money anymore. Like now life is good. <laughs> now we can spend everything and go crazy. Yeah. It's just the bar is higher now. You know, you have more yeah. expenses, more responsibility and everything. So I think that's interesting. Uh, but yeah, I think um, learning yeah. to... Helps you raise the baseline, you know? Then it's like, because you're not going to play with Elon Musk if you're worried about like if i say hey to be a client is you have to wire 25 grand if you're worried about 25 grand good luck charging someone 15 grand for your build and release as an example mm -hmm. right like it's it's a matter of it's it's weird because it's you can't explain it until you experience it right because logically it's like if we're on this podcast anyone who's listening it's like oh they're saying to spend 25 grand is nothing well yeah it is nothing and until you think it's nothing then you're probably still broke, right? Because mm -hmm. and this is the the relationship with money and like people. Because traditionally, like how people make money is through their time, right? One mm -hmm. hour this, I make this, this and that, this and that. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's so massive, twenty five grand. Oh my god! Like I have to spend. They see it in years, right? So mm -hmm. if if you ask me for twenty five grand US, it's probably thirty three k, which is more than I was earning a year at my nine to five, mm -hmm. right? So if you talk to me to the surge then, I would have probably thought of it in a year. Like the cost is one year of my life. Mm -hmm. But then everyone who's watching this should be working as as fast, as hard, go all in. So you never have to think that 30 grand is worth a year of your life. So is that scary? That's a scary way mm -hmm. to that's a scary thing to to fall into, thinking that your your money, money is your the way you earn is based on your time. But yeah. anyway, this hopefully everyday people are. Uh, it's, 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 it's like a change of perspective. You know, if yeah. you're, if you're making 10 bucks an hour, then that's how you sort of value things. Yeah. Like, okay. If I want to buy a pair of shoes, that's a hundred bucks. I need to work 10 hours for it. It's crazy. If you're making a grand an hour yeah. and from there, your perspective change, you're like, Oh, it's only yeah. one tenth to buy those sneakers. Let me get two of them, you know, it's two crazy. different colors. It's crazy. But yeah, no, we we're talking about school. Um, so now you're kind of like doing YouTube, then leading people to school. Uh, maybe that's a subject we can talk about. Because yeah. uh, for me, I haven't moved any of my communities there. Um, I think Sam, smart, you know, Hermosi Investing, smart, right? There's, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they have so much reach now. Yeah. So it's like anything they push is going to be great, right? But I've personally delayed it going moving there because um, – I'm like, the amount of investment and building is going to take to make the platform as good as it should be. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't like, I know how much work goes into a product and making it work and making it sticky. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I do love is how they've simplified the info space, mm -hmm. I guess the coaching space, right? They've all technically taken everything into one. Mm -hmm. Um but I don't know, man. Like, I still don't. I personally don't like the positioning of. I personally don't like to perceive it as school. Like, uh, as much as I am in the education space too, right? And as much as educating is part of what we do, mm -hmm. I want to get as. I'll keep my YouTube educational, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to be in the as much of the execution side as possible. And for me, school is not, it wouldn't work for what we do, right? In a sense of like, for the partners and the clients, mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't see myself using that platform for. Yeah. I, I think there's, do. there's different ways of using school. I think, I think mm -hmm. some people are using it as a traditional course where they just put all their videos there and that's what they're selling and mm -hmm. they put a monthly subscription to it. Um, I think at least for me, like I am on school starting at least yeah um i view it more as a way to just build a community and gather everyone in the same place so i'm not really viewing it as like a way to sell my courses and stuff but yeah. rather just gather all my people so mm. same, same way as you have nbl you have it on discord i think yeah so that's sort of my thought process it's yeah. just i'm doing let's say nbl but on school i'm using that platform and for me what's the most important sort of thing is to own sort of their 
their data, their information. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you're depending on school to be successful for your business to be successful. And if your entire revenue, your MRR is based on one platform, and if for whatever reason Sam Owens or Alex yep. Ramosi decides to, you know, slash or increase their commission or whatever, change their business model, you're screwed. Yeah, like you have nothing left. Correct. That's so, what. That's one of the reasons. That's one of the conversation I came down, uh, came to conclusion mm-hmm. when I was talking to one of the partners too, was building a community for yep. AI stuff. I was like, hey man, like as much as I love Sam, I don't want to build an entire business unit on a platform that I don't control. Because mm-hmm. if you really think about it, everybody who's moving all their communities on school, yeah. the person who's going to win at the end is Sam Ovens mm-hmm. and whoever invested in school. Because now they're getting you, a thousand other people to make money building them a platform Mm -hmm. it's almost like it's almost like you can look at it as facebook right the reason why facebook is a trillion dollar company is not the reason why facebook is a trillion dollar company and everyone who's on it is has never hasn't built a trillion dollar company is because the audience the users is more of a worthy business than the little e com, mm-hmm. the little service, the little fucking coaching, the little home legion, people mm-hmm. selling homes on there. No other business comes close to the business that owns the user. Yeah. Right? So I understand what, I mean, fuck shit. They're, uh, they're smarter than the most of us. That's why they're doing this network play. Mm-hmm. Right? But I don't like the, uh, I mean, it's not that I don't like. I think eventually I'll probably use it, yeah. but I will not monetize on there because, um, because I'm like, hey, like they control. Like, literally, if they say, mm-hmm. imagine you have a hundred thousand, if fifteen thousand, twenty thousand people who pay you X amount, right? You maybe build a five million dollar recur- business there, right? Yeah. And they're like, hey, um, we're gonna start processing whatever fee, mm-hmm. or we want X percentage, yeah. or hey, we're now gonna start promoting showing ads to your community you can't say nothing about it yeah. right you're going to be way too into it to be able to say anything yeah. right it's like it's funny because it kind of happened with someone in gcp mm-hmm. so um i think his name is dylan his first name yeah he runs the only fans agency or he teaches people how to start only fans agencies yeah. i think he was ranked seven or eight on the school community yeah and then he got a dm from sam owens saying that his content was not sort of suited for their platform yeah. and what happened they just removed them remote, from the yeah. leaderboard yeah so overnight he basically just lost everything crazy uh it makes me think of uh, these big youtubers too you know they build a giant platform uh and or then, audience on youtube and day. then they say the wrong thing and boom they're banned yeah and they lost everything yeah that's why it's like for me like you know one of the main thing we do for we're going to start doing with every client is like hey all the ads you're running all the youtube you're doing drive all that traffic to a platform that you own something Mm -hmm. that is less risky something you can move because it's like um it's a risk it's a risk it's it's a risk for your business for like as an example if you never collect leads and you're just like oh i have all my people on instagram who follow me who watch me every day you're crazy Mm -hmm. you're crazy like for me like you know we're building up our email it's almost have forty thousand people on there is that i have access to forty thousand people whenever i want like YouTube shut me down. Instagram could shut me down. Facebook groups could shut me down. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Please shut me down. Yeah. I don't care. Right? I think it's just important to di- diversify. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's essentially what we're trying to explain. Yeah. It's like in anything, not, not just your audience, but your, the way you make money, the way you mm-hmm. operate, everything has to be mm-hmm. diversified. You cannot rely on one thing yeah. and hope to... You know, yeah. achieve this crazy thing on one single source of income, one single platform. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, we had dinner a few months ago before I went traveling. Um, and uh, one of the things we talked about is you were still selling, right? You were still the main closer in your business. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Right. As much as closing is amazing, as much as you may be a great salesperson. I love it. 
Uh, but as if you if your goal is to build a business, then mm-hmm. being a closer is is useless. Yeah. Like not useless, but it's like you're way better off chasing a more leveraged skill mm-hmm. and then letting someone get rich from closing. Yeah. Right? Like it, it's not when I say this, I might because sometimes I may say things like, Oh, like fuck being a closer or hey, fuck this other scale. Yeah. It's not that fuck this other skill. It's like, no, it's an important skill. And whoever is doing it gotta be dialed in. Yeah. But it's always to the to the to the to the angle of like, if you get out of this, then you go do something more valuable. And if you do chase a bigger vision, if you chase a bigger mission, everybody under you gets richer. Yeah. I mean, more people can actually get under you. Mm-hmm. But if you just stay in the trenches, booking calls, closing those calls, yeah. fulfilling for those calls, like even client fulfillment, you sh- no leadership, no founder should be doing it. Go find someone who's, I mean, there's inf- like the people we're onboarding right now, people are way better at me at specific things. Yeah. I'm like, I would not even want to be in the same room as you, brother. Please do, do, please do. Show me what you can do. I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, I just let me be a dummy. I don't want him to do anything because it's, you're costing, you're costing your business growth and you're costing a vision to, to be, to be bigger. Mm-hmm. So maybe walk us through kind of like how, what was your experience? Cause I think you did hire a closer then maybe talk because that would be a great lesson yeah. for people, you know? So for the longest time, I worked in sales, door knocking and all of these things. And for almost a year, I was taking six, seven, eight calls per day mm-hmm. uh, ever since I started the business, which was like about a year ago. So for me, it was very sort of, it was how I ran the business. It was always me that was closing. No one can be better than me. I am the closer of the company. You guys do yeah. everything else. I'll take care of this. Don't worry about it. That's how I always operated. And then when we have that conversation, you asked me about my goal. You said, well, what's your goal for this year? And I told you it was 300K per, per month. And you're like, you're not going to close your way up to 300K, right? And I was like, well, why not? I can do it. And you're like, yeah, you can do it. But is that the smart move? Um, and that's when I realized that I was basically the biggest bottleneck of the company. Mm-hmm. I was asking myself, like, what's holding us back from making more money? And when I realized it was just me, because I was in the trenches, I was taking the calls and I was limiting sort of the lead flow. That's when I realized I was like, okay, I kind of fucked up. Like, I should probably hire someone and at least try it out and see how it goes. Yeah. Funny enough, I found someone, placed him on a team. Now he's my full-time closer. He is closing more than I do. He has a higher closing rate. And even with his commission, we end up making more money just because he is a better closer than I am yeah. on the product. So not only did I I have the time now to come and do a podcast with you and not have to worry about taking calls afterwards. But you're making more money. And too. I'm, making, I'm making more money too. Yeah. So that was the biggest lesson for me probably the last, I yeah. think it's been two months he's on the team. So it's, it's pretty yeah. recent. It's been like a huge. Yeah. It's the best. It's the best thing. Now, we've kind of like, that's why for me, it's like for every partner we work with in JCP, if you're still selling, I'm like, hey, w- what the fuck? Because mm-hmm. it's like, if you're still selling, then I, I am not making any money. Because yeah. then you're just bringing in some, okay, you're making 50K a month. Okay, great. But the, that's not enough money yeah. for you to eat and and client acquisition that I eat. So like one of the things we do is like, we want to remove all the constraints. Mm-hmm. Lead flow, ads. Um Appointment setting, dialing, yeah. closing. N- no, don't don't close no more. <laughs> Please don't. I don't want to see you taking any calls, right? And then you just spend time, content, sales letter, build your brand, yeah. build a moat, mm-hmm. right? Uh, showcase what you're doing, and then you know maybe be in the back end, help your team, consult your clients, and be yeah. a better project manager. But like business is 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 a. Is a weird thing because it's like you fall in love with what got you to somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm sure, like probably a year ago or you know whatever, two years ago, if you probably asked me, "Hey, do you, do you close?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm I'm a great closer." Yeah. Uh, but then at some point, I probably was also like, "Oh, do you write daily emails?" I was like, "Yeah, I love writing daily emails, right?" But it's like you have to give up something you really like to grow, mm-hmm. right? If it's it was closing for you, yeah. for some people, it's appointment setting. For others, it's onboarding clients, right? And it's like, I haven't onboarded a client in the last, I don't know how long, Mm -hmm. right? And it's like, sometimes like, oh, but if I don't onboard them, then they're going to feel a certain way. No. 
you sh- a client should be excited that they don't get to talk to you because then they actually see what a business looks like. Yeah. If you're there on board and all they do is speak with you or speak with me, it's like that person is not running a business. That mm-hmm. person is just, you're only going to learn from him on how he got you in there, yeah. but you better not learn from him how to run the business. Mm-hmm. Right? It's yeah. very true. So um, It doesn't yeah. make sense to learn sort of from one expert and this person is supposed to be an expert in sales and marketing and emails or whatever offer you're you're doing yeah Uh, that's another big lesson that i have now instead of trying to learn everything myself i find someone who has the experience of years on me and i have them sort of join the team and they document all their knowledge and then i use that as leverage yeah Um, so i think that's very important as well no yeah cool Love it. So, um, so you just run, launched ads. You want to kind of like tell people kind of like how you were going about your appointment setting. So, yep. so for for me, um, appointment setting worked extremely well. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I had a very good team. Uh, luckily, one of the first people to have ever joined my team was uh, someone who was an appointment setter. He didn't have the funds to join that five hundred dollar product. He's like Oliver. Let me get you ten clients, and then from there, let me join for free. I was mm-hmm. like, okay. Uh, we worked together and he basically generated the same amount of revenue I would typically do in a month. And he did it in a couple of days wow. by joining the team. So that's when I discovered cold uh, DMs. And I was like, hey, that's actually a way you can get clients. Yeah. Um, so ever since then, like he stuck with me. We built an entire team. Um, I have maybe 10 to 12, 13 appointments that are now working with me. Mm-hmm. And we've reached a point now with the company um, at more or less 100K per month. Yeah where I realized that if I want to make 200K per month, I cannot just 2X the amount of appointment errors that I have and make 200K. It mm-hmm. doesn't work that way. You reach a point where a certain method or an acquisition structure that you're using in a company does not, like it's it's capped. Mm-hmm. You, you basically have to move on to the next thing. Yeah. And for me, that's another thing um, I took away from GCP is sort of the power of ads and how that can, such, it's, it's basically like an easy way to leverage you record one piece of content and then you use money and you just push it as yeah. much as you want. Um, so recently, once I reached that sort of bandwidth of appointment setting, which is 100K, uh, we recently launched ads. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to know, but um, I'm not too worried with all of the results that I'm seeing in GCP. It seems like most people are running ads. They are Everyone. getting good results. Everyone. So Everyone. Um, for me, it's just like a, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, just diversifying the way I'm scaling this company. I'm not just relying on appointment errors, but I have multiple streams yeah, of yeah. lead. Yeah, I don't think you should. I mean, I don't think you should actually. Ads without the appointment thing is actually not going to work. It will work, but it will be too inefficient, yeah. right? But um, maybe to kind of like help people understand why, as someone, I mean, at our peak, I think we're placing like 90 setters a month, mm-hmm. right? 90 VAs a month. And, um, you know, we probably did it for over 600 businesses from 2021 to end of 2020. I mean, almost mid-2023, right? But one of the things I realized is that um, it's not actually that clients... Clients were seeing results, not all of them. Mm -hmm. Because some of them, it's also based on how you manage the setters, right? But it's not... What made me switch to ads is not that the appointment setting wasn't working. The issue was... It was taking way too long for clients to see the outcome that we wanted. Mm -hmm. And that hurts. I'll I'll give you maybe an important lesson here, right? But if you don't get someone results fast, you Mm -hmm. don't get to charge them faster. What I mean by that is, let's say someone comes into your building release maybe to pay 10K, 15K, Mm -hmm. okay? You're not going to ask him another 20K unless they've you fulfilled on the first thing. So if they're doing outreach, right? And then it takes them uh, 60 days to really dial it in mm-hmm. to get some consistent. That's not 60 days to scale. That's 60 days to get consistency on the outreach, yeah. right? Maybe they they month 3, that's when they start closing some deals. That's not in that's too long of a of a timeline for you to solve another problem, right? And for us, the way client acquisition is structured is uh, it's like we have GCP, but we have departments under it, right? Whether that be advertising, whether that be systems, ops, whether that be like, you know, whatever other things, mm-hmm. sales and whatever, appointment setting. It's like we 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 need you to have another problem so we can actually 
do more business and helps you greater, especially since now we're getting ref share from every partner. It's like, I don't want you taking 60 days to make any money. I need you making money by month, week two of you joining the program and you becoming a partner. Mm -hmm. So ads was costing us more success not because not because we we weren't uh not because we weren't making money but because in order for us to make crazy money with our partners we need to be using the most leveraged channel that exists yeah. so um, as an example we had a one client who jumped into in december um w- was making around 10k a month ended january around 42k a month february 1st first seven days first nine days of the month uh he had already made first seven days of the month he had already made like 33k wow. right it's but it's like that type of transform and then and then what's even better is that he went from spending 10k down mm-hmm. to join gcp and in the last 60 days or less he spent an extra 30 grand with us that's crazy but how do you ask someone for 30 Gs after they've just spent 10K and they were only making 10K a month before? You can't do that if you're fucking using some unleveraged shit. Mm-hmm. I need to make you rich so I can then collect more money from you. Yeah. So it's like the speed of success dictates how our businesses actually grow. We cannot grow from new clients, new clients, new clients, new clients a month. That That's like a crazy business. Like it's actually crazy. Like yeah. I'm emphasizing this. If the way you make money is new clients every single month. I mean, you might as well go hunting. You might as we might as well still be living in the fucking jungle and hunting to go find meat because that's literally what mm-hmm. you're doing, it's right? True. It's I'm saying maybe my, it's might not be your five hundred grand, five hundred dollars, but it's still that ten k, fifteen k, even a ten k hunting. Mm-hmm. It's still hunting. It's still fucking annoying. Yeah. Right. So we needed to build a protocol where we can make someone 100 grand in the first 45 days, 60 days that they work with us. Because if that person starts making 100 grand a month, the systems they had, the team they had Mm -hmm. to get to to make 10K or 20K, 25, 30K a month, you're going to need to scale because you're going to make way too much money and your infrastructure is not supporting the new level of success. So, So now for us, it's like, that's what we're doing. It's like, hey, let's make your shit ton of money. Hey, cool. You need new infrastructure? Yeah. We have we are your operations, we are advertising, we're your systems, we can help you find setters, dialers, closers. And that's a much better. So now we have like a community of people who are just printing and then that's more a that's a just it's just much better, man. You need your clients to make money so you can make more money. Mm-hmm. And um for me, like that's one of the lessons that I've that I've had for since kind of like pivoting to um to the to the what we're doing today. I know you have like a unique, not a unique, but a different approach when it comes to ads. Yeah. I think most people are very heavy on like the direct pitch. So the classic types of offers like, hey, I'll guarantee you yeah. X amount or I'll you know, walk your dog for the rest of your yeah. life and give your money back and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> what is like, I know there's the value. Yeah, value funnel, funnel. Just like a value funnel. And the direct pitch. Yeah. For you, like which one do you prefer and what do you think most people? Uh, okay, so here's also something. I prefer something, but we still do the other mm-hmm. depending on the data we have in different niches, right? So if we're working with a business that's like going after local businesses, yeah. we most of the time will use like kind of like a direct pitch, right? We'll test it first because it might not be as competitive and people will actually book the calls, mm-hmm. right? Clients get super cheap calls and, yeah. you know, brick and mortar or local services, but when it comes to like online, I still think that direct pitch works. But the reason why I think, because I think just because you get leading indicators that are fine, like you're like, oh wow, cheap cost per cheap cheap cost per book call, mm-hmm. cheap cost per lead, you may think that oh wow, that's good. Yeah. But you may actually end up realizing that even though you're getting ten dollar. $7 leads and then maybe $70, $50 per booked call mm-hmm. on a direct thing, it might actually end up taking you 20 people to even close one deal, yeah. right? So a lot of people who don't understand about how, how long sales cycles affect your how much money you make, 
will pick this, right? They'll be like, oh, well, I'm getting cheap cost. I'm getting also appointments. I'm getting, I'm closing every 15, 20 calls I get on yeah. because I'm finding that one person actually wants to buy. Mm -hmm. For me, I like the value funnel because of the following. We're optimizing for the thing that makes it inevitable for us not to end up making money mm -hmm. with the most amount of leads. The reason why I do 15 hours of content for like a challenge where I educate people on coming, becoming growth creators and selling, build and release is not that I can't go to meta and be like, hey, give me people who want appointments mm -hmm. or give me people who want to make more money with their business. That's not the case. The reason why I don't want to do that is because that's what everybody else is doing. But if I told you how much money these guys have to spend to make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know guys who are spending like 70K a month, 90K a month to make 200 grand a month. Yeah. I'm like, what What kind of business is that? I don't want marketing to cost me 40% of my margins. Mm -hmm. That's not sustainable, yeah. right? But for us, with this value, when we lead with value first, and it doesn't have to be a five-day challenge or it doesn't yeah. have to be a long content, but even if it's one VSL that's like 30, 45, 60 minutes, maybe one hour and 30 minutes, um, that's still enough to lead with value where you solve a problem. And then by the time they get on a call, they have the beliefs you need to sell them. Yeah. So I would rather speak to 10 people who believe yeah. than 100 people that I have to hard close, right? And... That's across the board because it shows. It's like, you know, we spend 40K on ads, we make a million dollars in a quarter. Yeah. Guys are spending three times that making 200 grand because they didn't, they didn't invest enough in their lead and nurture them enough to be able to collect way more. I don't want to collect 500 bucks. I want to yeah. collect five grand, 10 grand, 15 grand, 25 grand on someone who I don't know. Mm -hmm. But no one will spend that kind of money with you unless they have trust mm -hmm. or or like they believe that this they believe like is it like do they believe or not mm -hmm. very true like most of the, the the clients that we work with are charging high ticket and they come into the space they have no social proof no personal brand no nothing yeah. and they feel like they deserve a 15k ticket price i'm like you don't deserve it yet like yeah. you're a nobody respectfully you know if i look you up online there's no social proof there's nothing and i think for me one of the key reasons why I've been able to scale this quickly is because of my personal brand. If it wasn't for that, I would not be. YouTube? Uh, mostly YouTube, Instagram. Uh, yeah. Those are my favorite platforms. If it wasn't for those things, I, I would not be at 100K per month. Guaranteed, yeah. for sure. And I know this for a fact because there's yeah. some people from GCP who are doing similar offers to what I'm doing. Who and I never will, see the same returns. They're not it? seeing the same returns and I'm getting their appointments. Yeah. They're coming to me. They're like, yeah, I spoke to this guy. Do you know him? I'm like, yes, I do. Yeah. It's like, I'd rather work with you because you have the social proof. I know you can actually deliver what you're promising. Yeah. So I think that's a mistake. Funny enough, like many people are shy to put themselves out there or whatever. I think if you want to run an online business without a personal brand, yeah, it's a bit crazy. You know? Yeah, funny enough. And this is something that kind of like, it was like a coincidence or I don't know if that's the right word. But so I called the program GCP, right? Mm -hmm. Growth Creator Program. But... I didn't want to call the growth partner because we're not we're not leading people to become growth partners because just because you can solve a problem does not mean you're yet at a point where you can become a partner. Like yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to become a partner to someone who's making 10k a month. Yeah. Because it's like, what are they gonna do? Just work, give me 40 hours a week. I don't want 40 hours a week of work. I want 120 hours from mm -hmm. uh from a group of, of people, right? So they don't have the resources, right? But uh, so I had to call a growth creator because we're also not just trying to be partners. We're not just strictly just going for rev share mm -hmm. and for long term deals. We're just coming in 90 days. I'll build and release this thing you need. Right. But that's the growth part of the name. Mm -hmm. Creator is actually build a YouTube, build a personal brand. Like actually create content. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I don't think I've yet communicated this, but yeah. growth creator is like, hey, you help people with growth, but you're also a creator. Yeah. This shit here, oh my God. I mean, you're we're here. Mm -hmm. Last year, you were make two years ago, you were broke. You're here making six figures a month. What the fuck, bro? Yeah. Like, what the actual fuck? I'm 2020, summer. Quit a 2K a month job. Mm -hmm. 
the following January, I make 10K a month appointment setting in 2021. End of 2022, I'm making 600 grand a month. What the actual fuck? Mm -hmm. You cannot, this is not, oh, we're the best acquisition. We're the, no, we've just figured out a formula where you master one thing and you go deep into it. You mm-hmm. gain an edge over most people because they're fucking lazy, right? And then you go create content. Go educate the market. Mm-hmm. And then you create a build and release. You go, instead of just being a coach and a fucking info person, because that's commoditized, right? You go take this, the edge, and you sell it as an infrastructure and you merge the content. I think merging these two things, like you have an edge and you also can uh, create content, assets, demonstrate the fact that you're good. I actually do think how everybody out there is like, oh, build a one man billion dollar million dollar business. I I think that's that's stupid because that's that's thinking that okay then people won't copy you. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just build a info or newsletter type of business because that's like the very low barrier of entry is subscribe for Substack and go tweet. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do it. Yeah. So the reason why you still need to sell something tangible is because then most people don't know how to hire. They can't do project management. They can't build systems. They are so dumb. They can't even educate people properly. So the reason why we still want to sell infrastructure is because it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard. That means anything that is hard, most people won't do. The reason why I was still making the, the half a million a month was because I was placing 90 setters a month. I don't know any fucking one with the reach I had, with the resources, with the talent I had. Like even people infinitely ahead of me who are making three million a month, I don't think they had the same operations I had. They wouldn't have pulled it off. So inevitably, I had built something that could deliver something that was hard to deliver. Inevitably made money. Mm -hmm. Because even if someone tried to copy me, I don't think most people would have pulled off selling 40 people and you've got to place two setters in each of the 40 businesses that you sold. You got to build their outbound. You got to track everything. You got to give them Facebook profiles. Mm-hmm. Then you got to, if it breaks, you got to give them, replace them. Then you got to get clarity sessions with yeah. each one. Then you got to build the messaging. Then you got to build the, the the profiles. Then you got to make sure that you're mm-hmm. checking, give them the tracking sheets. Then you got to review their looms. Yeah. It's like, bro, try to scale that to half a million a month and tell me about it. You're not going to be able to. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like while everyone is trying to go to the info, no, bring it all fucking back down to operations. Do something that is hard. Yeah. That is the only way I know to stay in business. Because I promise you this, people are going to watch this interview. They're going to go check out your YouTube. They're going to check out my YouTube. They're going to be like, oh, they sell information. And then they're going to go on YouTube. They're going to be like, hey, agencies, <laughs> scale your business to 10K a month, right? Yeah. And then there's going to be not one guy who's watching this, not Two girls, not five guys, not 10 bisexual people. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be 100 people. Including everyone. Else. Copy, paste. So now here's the thing. And now, there was a pool of agencies who needed, maybe needed to scale to, to, uh, to 1,000. Let's say there is 5,000 agencies who actually are like, hey, I need help scaling to 10K a month, yeah. right? But then... You were competing maybe with 30 people. Now it's going to go to 300 people that you're competing with, right? Now 300 people are going to sell to the same 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now 5,000 people is being divided into 300 service providers. Now the most, if the market cap of 5,000 people served is 50 million, then it's 50 million distributed with 300 businesses, Mm -hmm. brokey businesses. So that's why for me, I try to tell people, get into building infrastructures as much as you can. Like build something tangible that is hard to copy. It's, I mean, try to try to compete with a company like NVIDIA or try to copy with Google. Mm-hmm. The reason why they have thousands of employees is not that they can't run the business without them. It's the fact that no one else is going to be willing to build and pay 10,000 employees. I checked a, a business that had six, seven, uh, this, this, this this professional consulting business at Accenture. It has 700,000 employees. Wow. Like imagine trying to fucking compete with them. 
Imagine onboarding one employee, mm -hmm. two employees, five employees, 700,000. You can't. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get the market share, make 64 billion like they did last year, here's the journey, brother. 700,000 people. You better fucking lay them here. Mm -hmm. Just These copy them. It's easy. Copy. Yeah, please. It's easy. <laughs> copy. Really easy. Find it's like it's, like, <laughs> it's like building school and then quitting a course. Yeah. You copy it from probably Oliver, mm -hmm. right? So it's like the harder it is, the better. Yeah. Like the bro, like, and this is this is also an advice for you. Go where it's hard. Go where it's hard. Whenever it's easy, it's good. Go hard. Yeah. But I've seen I've seen people go out of business way too many times because they they kept chasing. They thought that, oh, I could just go make a TikTok and go viral and then sell a five thousand dollar course. Or I could go on ads have a low ticket thing, then sell people. No, eventually the market is going to be like, hey, okay, I don't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. Why do I, I have ChatGPT or I have this tool for 50 bucks a month where I can get everything I need on outreach, yeah. right? So like we're, so like, yeah, I like, I, I, I know, I know I, I have, I'm starting to get a little bit more risk averse. Like I, I look at risk in an, like in an important, I, I, I'll wake up and be like, okay, how can we play the game? How can I go places where most people won't go? Because I know if I go there, 99% of people will not go there. And then, I, okay, I'll compete with the 1%. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm okay. I might not win. But let me compete with at least the best of the mm -hmm. best. You know, Let me not be the best, but I'll want to be in the, yeah. in the arena with it's the best. Insight. I remember when we had dinner, I asked you that exact question. Yeah. I was like, why do you pick the hard game? Yeah. For what? I'm like, you could just sell a course for the same yeah. price. I know, and right? Like, you would have zero fulfillment. Yeah. And I even brought this up to you. I was like, I'm thinking of doing that. You know, like, why make my life easier? Why have to deal why, with all well, these things? Why? Why do BNR? Why make it hard? You know. But it's true. If you if you look at it long term, you're selling something unique. That's to yes. you. Combine it with your personal brand, and then from there, it's, no it's, one can compete. Bro, no one you're, can you're, compete. You're... No one, and it makes it so easy. Because mm -hmm. I can, I, I can. Literally, in one of the VSL I'm making next month, it's like, hey, um, do you have an edge in a specific market? Maybe do you have a YouTube channel? Um, come and partner with us. We'll turn that into a build and release, uh, and I'll put a quarter of a million worth of talent to back you up. Who the fuck, a mm -hmm. quarter of a million a month in peril to back you up and scale your offer? Who the fuck is going to, Who? okay, they can compete. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of people who claim they can scale businesses. Yeah. But how many actually have their payroll be a quarter of a million? And it's not a quarter of a million on like setters or marketers or closers. It's like mm -hmm. on operations, backend, support, success, growth consultants, advertisers, sales leaders, set, setter leaders, right? So I use that to my advantage. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, go buy this coaching program. I mean, you can go buy... $30,000 masterminds, $70,000 masterminds, $10,000 co coaching programs from people who have better watches than me. I don't even have a watch. People who have 10,000 cars more than me, right? But let's look at the support you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the insights. Let's look at the infrastructure you're going to get. Yeah. And it's like, they have quarter of a million dollar cars, but I'm sure their fucking payroll ain't no fucking way that it's, it's probably like five grand a month. Yeah. So on sales calls, my team can go be like, hey, you're giving us 25 G's and percentage of your company. Or you can go, here is every, here is payroll. You, you can go hire these people yourself. Mm -hmm. You can go build these systems yourself. That's totally fine. So it's like, it gives us, uh, it gives us, we don't have to sell. Why do we have to sell you? Yeah. Why, why we, you know, there's probably smarter people with you who would make the trade mm -hmm. 25 grand in exchange of a quarter of a million per month or 200 grand in leverage per month. Yeah. I'd make that deal any I mean I would buy my thing and not have to pay. I mean mm -hmm. I'm like, so who's your growth consultant? Oh, who's the guy leading ads? Please mm -hmm. do it. You know, so it's like so that makes it easy to sell. But now now I have to be a good marketer to actually sell that too. You know, so it's yeah. not I'm not saying like go build up a team and go invest in this, go mm -hmm. invest in that. But be be you make kind of like calculated investments right so i might put a hundred grand to get this sales guy to come in and consult and build a sales playbook to help our business scale 
but also I'm taking that same playbook and giving it to our mm -hmm. partners, right? So it's strategic. I'm not just investing a lot of money into nothing. I'm, I'm like, okay, can I get this playbook for a hundred grand and then go apply it to all our partners? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's a no brainer investment. Cause then if we can two X the closing rate on all the part hundred plus businesses that we're partnered up with, yeah. that's a shit ton of more money. So it's like for a hundred grand. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Let's no, do it. It's very true. When I started, um, I think when I was at like 20K per month or something, I spent almost all of it on talent. Like wow. I had almost no margins. Yeah. However, I, that was my unfair uh, advantage. advantage over yeah. everyone else. Is that while these people were saving 20K and they were spending it on themselves, I'm like, fuck it, let me just reinvest it all into talent. Yeah. And because of that, I had 20K of payroll back then. Um, yeah. So when people joined me, it was very easy to sell them because they saw easy. the value, they saw the talent. That's everything. everything. And everything. also I, I leveraged the talent for myself, too, for my company. So it's a win-win. You help yeah. your clients win more by having better talent. And with that talent, you can make more money because they're helping your business scale as yeah. well. thousand percent. So I think it's, um, I, I think you said that once. I'm like, a business that has very high profit margins, it, it's not like, a, you can tell a lot about the business yeah. depending on their margins. Yeah. It you know for sure it's, if it's like software then yeah cool but it's like in in our in in now it could be it could be a highly profitable business like mm -hmm. like gross margins need to be high like you know you need to be like seventy percent eighty percent to really be super super like sustainable yeah. but like to say that you're still at eighty percent net margins is kind of like it tells says i mean it's like i just know you're not reinvesting and improving your product yeah. or service because it's like yeah it's like it's because it's like saying you have a lot of profit margins it's like saying that um that like okay you're buying protein but you have 80 percent of all the protein that you're supposed to intake in your fridge mm -hmm. it's like well it's not actually smart to necessarily have a bunch of chicken yeah. in your fridge you got to eat them if you want to actually make gains, mm -hmm. right? So it's like you're making a lot of money and at the end of the month, you're just pushing it here or wasting it on cars or wasting it on traveling. People who travel, you guys, mm -hmm. kill me, man. The fuck? I, I was Cape Town. <laughs> I mean, travel to Cape Town for one week, then have fun, drink some wine. That's good. But like, don't travel around like a digital no, nomad, right? Know. But what it means is um, you're kind of like, keeping a lot of resources, a lot of energy, potential mm -hmm. energy, and you're not reinvested. Because I'm sure, I sure them, I'm, I'm sure that the thing you built yourself is not the best thing for mm -hmm. your clients. And you have these this resource, this capital that you could allocate in making this 10 times better, but you prefer going and bragging online that you have 85% margins. Mm -hmm. Like that's literally saying, hey, I don't care about my clients. I just care about bragging. Mm -hmm. And then dummy people love the bragging. So they buy the bragging yeah. and thinking that the product is going to be the same as the bragging. If I spend most of my time bragging about what how much money I make, it actually means then, okay, then you're not building because ain't nobody got time to be talking <laughs> if they actually have clients who are like, hey, lead flow is down or appointments is down or mm -hmm. closed deals is down. Like you're dealing with a lot of stress. So it's like you need to be using this money to solve the problems, not go brag that you have crazy margins. I think also like for me, like I'd be lying if I said at the beginning, I wasn't like that. I was trying to save as much money as I could and yeah. keep it to myself, not to flex and everything. I think for me, and I know many people are in the same boat, is they have this scarcity mindset, yeah. especially when they're starting. They're like, wow, I got lucky this month. I made this amount of money, but mm -hmm. is it going to last next month? Yeah. So I need to save some money just in case it doesn't go well next month. Yeah. And I'd be curious to know on your end with like a crazy payroll like that, does that yeah. ever happen to you? You're like, fuck, I need to make X amount of money unless otherwise like everything goes to shit. Uh, so there's a weird thing. That is, I had to shift my perspective, okay? So mm -hmm. let's say if I'm running a 50K a month business, and let's say I'm making, um, maybe I only have 15K in payroll, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, I can pay people multiple times over and I'll still be good, right? Mm -hmm. So you're ne you're never kind of like worry about revenue, but you're also not spending enough. So you don't, you don't have any reason to worry, yeah. right? But the thing I had to shift is, would you rather have 
fifteen thousand a month worth of talent that tries to like make you money every month, or would you rather have two hundred grand worth of people worrying about making you rich? It's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I could. Let's say, let's say we get out of here and I get hit by a car, mm -hmm. right? I can't work tomorrow. I can't think. I can't make decisions. I'm sick, whatever, blah, 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 right? I have enough talent in the business where maybe they might not lead the, the ship where I would lead it, mm -hmm. but they would lead it well enough. Decisions would be done, great decisions enough to make the business money. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, yeah. It's, so it's so it's it's this ability to buy mm -hmm. to it's like I have 200 grand invested every month to make sure I make a return. Okay. And that's kind of like how you should see it. Mm -hmm. you, sh you shouldn't see it as like a cost. You should see it as a as like instead of me spending my days trying to think like okay, mm -hmm. how are we going to get appointments? How are we going to structure this? How are we going to edit this video? How are we going to pay parking, right? Or where is this place? Or this, hey, this podcast studio. Like, yeah. we didn't find it. Someone found it for us, right? So it's like, it's all that. But it's time. It's like, can you yeah. can you use, can you access time and decisions without yeah. having to be the one to ex, to expend that energy? Yeah. And that's where it's like, then it's like, you know, imagine for someone who has a billion dollars a year in payroll. Yeah. That person has insane amount of leverage. They can make anything happen anytime. Yeah. So it's like, is it worth? Mm -hmm. Do you, do they worry? No, they could. If I pay a billion dollars a year, I hopefully find one person who can actually think how to make ten billion. Hopefully, yeah. I think in order to have people like that, people you can trust, mm -hmm. they need to be really invested into your company. They have mm -hmm. to believe it. They have to believe in you and oh, everything. Yeah. And I think most people at the beginning are hiring, you know, these random people from Facebook Average groups and people. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's when. That scarcity mindset kicks in, but for sure, yeah. When you have good talent, people you trust, people who, you know trust in the company, and they see it, uh, they view the company as their own. Mm -hmm. I think that's when things go a bit crazy. Yeah, cool. So uh, maybe to kind of like wrap it up, yeah. um, what are the goals this year, and uh, what what are we gonna do to get there? So uh, for me personally, goals to three x revenue, okay. so three hundred k per month. Why three hundred? That's one sale per day. 10, so Let's 10k go. 10k per day basically that's what i'm trying to make Love it. um how I, are we gonna get there i am not gonna close my way up to 300k we already crossed that off the bucket list mm -hmm. um but no uh probably gonna leverage ads mm -hmm. go super hard on content uh this month uh or this year rather so yeah. for people that don't know uh, i have a youtube channel as well so i'll be posting daily um and then in combination with paid ads organic and everything uh trying to increase lead flow yeah i have the infrastructure in place already that's what I spent probably the last three, four months building. Yeah. So we can fulfill for 300K. Now I need to get that lead flow in. Sick. And I think with paid ads using, um, you know, the team that you have, your 250K payroll um, <laughs> and my payroll as well. I think yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's only, inevitable. It's man. only a matter it's of time. Yeah, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. And then uh, I'll help you structure one webby and then we do that in a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool. We can do it. We can do it. Maybe for summer, right? Like summer, if uh, if you... You know, go run the ads, scale everything. But this summer, if we want to have a good summer, um, let's do a Webby. Uh, can help you structure it. And then uh, mm -hmm. clear a little quarter mill. Then we go on a retreat. Then now uh, we can drink some wine. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, guys, hopefully you guys enjoyed this um, podcast. You guys can find uh, Olivier Robitaille. I don't know if they're French gonna last out, name. Yeah, I don't know how uh, they're gonna find how to. They're gonna find you. We're yeah, gonna tag you somewhere uh, uh, below. They'll tag me, but yeah, thank you for having me over. Um, yeah. I'm mostly active on Instagram and YouTube. It's my full name all combined, so Oliver Robitaille. Yeah, uh, you'll find it. Don't worry. <laughs> As you yeah. said, I'll, I'll, I'll comment. I'll, we'll leave the tags and stuff. But yeah, thank you very much for having me over. Yeah, but congrats on your success, man. Thank like you, you know, much. it's all you. It's like everything is you. You seek the path. You mm -hmm. went on down the path and. You know, everything is up to you. So. Everything is possible. And that's yeah. what that, I think that's the biggest lesson I learned this year. Uh, 12 months ago, I was not in this situation. Everything yeah. has been super quick. So for many, I know at least for me, when I was watching these people on podcasts or YouTube videos, I would look at them. And I'm like, oh my God, this yeah. is impossible to achieve. Yeah. And then when you stop worrying and you actually start working, it's funny how the results, they slowly come. Crazy. And you, 
Yeah. And maybe we're going to have more people in Montreal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. Hopefully we, there's we, someone we watching this. I, I have a couple of clients from Montreal. We Let's could. Uh... Yeah. You know, you tell them, hey, they need to be on this interview <laughs> next. You know, next year, it's like one good case study every, every year from Montreal. I think that's one a year. Mm-hmm. Then eventually two a year. Then a hundred a year. That yeah. would be sick. We'll, but, we'll bring Montreal back yeah, to the map. Need, yeah. We need to put Montreal on the map. Uh, a lot of people in Montreal are not. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. They're going to cat cart. Playing hockey, man. Yeah. Eating Putin, Belle Province. That's it. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, but no, guys, thank you guys for checking it out. Uh, see you guys on the next one.